Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Andromeda's Edge. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing the first few rounds of the game today. Now, before we go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and gain access to a wide variety of exclusive perks, then please go to patreon.com slash Games. Some of those perks include being able to watch my opinions episodes, where I go in-depth about the things I like and don't like about all the games that I'm playing recently. You can also watch some of the videos I make early and advertisement-free, and gain access to an exclusive podcast feed where you can hear audio versions of all of the vlogs that I make, as well as those opinions episodes. Now, the final thing I'd like to ask is if while you're watching this video, some part of the game really jumps out to you as interesting, then please comment about that down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the click on subtitles. I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. I do want to point out that everything you see here today is prototype components, so the art and component quality that you see here might not match up with the production version. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. In it, each player is in control of a different faction, and each of these factions has fled to the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, we are at the edge of that galaxy, right next to a dense nebula. Now, within Andromeda, there are a variety of planets, as well as alliance hubs, where we can gain benefits from the diverse skills of the beings that are already established at the edge of Andromeda. In addition to this, there are hostile extragalactic raiders that are going to be coming in through the nebula and attacking anyone who gets too close. Now, each player begins the game with just their space station and a few transport ships in their launching bay. On a player's turn, they are going to take a ship from the launching bay and place it out onto one of these spots. They will then get to do actions there, and on future turns, they can place new ships within range of their previously placed ships. Some range is one, which means you have to go adjacent, whereas other ships that you can build into have longer range, which lets you reach farther out on the board. Now, there are many different types of actions you can do out here, from collecting these moon tokens that can be used for resources or to be slotted into the space station to gain ongoing benefits. Players can also construct new ships at the shipyard. In addition to that, they can develop into large buildings that get placed onto planets. As we are doing these things, we might find ourselves fighting the raiders or each other, and when we do fight, we're going to be rolling a bunch of dice, as well as adding various effects from our board positioning and tactics cards that we have in our hands. Now, another thing players can do instead of sending their ships out is they could spend their entire turn collecting all of their ships from out here, as well as from the scrapyard where destroyed ships can go, and these ships are going to come back to the space station, and the non-destroyed ships can actually activate various modules within that player's space station. There are actions out here that let us buy new modules that go over here, thus giving us new options to activate when our ships come home. After they come back, they'll then go to our launching bay, where they can once again be used to head out here and do more actions in future turns. Now we're going to keep playing the game until a certain number of victory points have been met, then everyone will take one more turn, and then we'll do final scoring where we get points for a wide variety of things, and then the player with the most victory points will be the winner. Now I've obviously gone quickly over so many different things in this game, and there are many aspects to it that I haven't even touched on just yet, and don't worry, I'll explain how all of this works while we are actually playing. On that note, I think it's time to begin the game. For today's tutorial, we are going to play as the purple player right over here, and we are also the starting player for the game, so let's jump right into our first turn of the game. Now, at the start of every player's turn, there is a key decision to make. That is, are we going to be launching ships out onto the board, or are we going to be returning our ships back to our station? Now, if you have no ships to return, then you must launch, and that is the state that everyone is in at the beginning. So we have to launch. Now this action is split into four different steps, and the first step involves us choosing a starship in our launching bay. As you can see, at the beginning of the game, we have three transport ships and none of the other ships. I'll explain how we get these later on, so let's select this transport right here, and then we have to choose one of these hex spots to place this ship down onto. Now, as you can see, we don't have any ships out here already, so this is our first ship launched. Whenever you do a first launch, you cannot place that ship onto a hex that has ships of any other factions, including the non-player raiders faction. 
We are also not allowed to go onto any of these nebula spots unless the ship that we are launching has the voyage ability and our transport currently doesn't have that. I'll explain these nebulas and voyage in more detail a little bit later on, but what this means is we can actually place onto any of these spots because of course we're the first players to put a ship down. After considering these options, I think we want to place right over here. And it's important to note that on future launch actions, when we put another ship down onto the board, we have to place that new ship within range of a previously placed one of our ships. Every ship has a range amount. As you can see, our transports have a range of one, whereas our fighters have a range of two. We don't have any fighters just now, but that's a good thing to keep in mind. This means if we want to launch next turn, we'll be forced to place this new transport one range away from our previously placed transport. So we have to keep that in mind when we're making these decisions, and I think I'm okay with this location. After placing the ship down, we can move to the second step of a launch turn, where we must perform the action indicated by the spot that we launched onto. There are a variety of actions out here, but of course, this is the spot that we went to. And as you can see, this is a planet. Now, planets always start the game with three of these moon tokens placed on top of it that specifically match the color of that planet. Now, the only action you can do on a planet is take the top moon token. So that means we have to take this one, which reveals another moon token. And if there are no moon tokens on the planet, then instead of taking a token, you just take one resource that's indicated. In this case, that is nanocarbon. So you could just take one of those tokens from the supply. Of course, that is not the case currently. We took this moon token from that planet since that is the only action available to us there. Every time we take a moon token, we then have to put it into our moon token storage. As you can see, we have four of these spots available to us. And if all four were full already and we gained a new one, then we could optionally then abandon it, gaining the benefit that's printed on the front. Now, these moon tokens are important because we could spend them in order to get any resources shown. For example, this one says we could spend it to gain a nanocarbon or one ice resource. Or we could place these down into various slot spots on our board to get ongoing benefits from them. And I'll explain how that works in greater detail later on. After completing our action, we can now move to the third step of our turn, where we check to see if any of these non-player raiding pieces are going to move. In order to do this, we have to check range. And at the start of the game, there is a Vorticon striker here and there. And as you can see, they have a range of one. What that means is they can only move to an adjacent spot out here on the grid. And as you can see, the spot that we launched to is two spaces away from each one of those raiders, which was definitely a consideration I had in mind. Now, if any raiders had range that reached to the active spot, which is the location that was launched to on this turn, then during this third step, one of those raiders would move onto this spot. Now, I do want to mention that these strikers are a little bit special. They move as a group whenever they can, but I'll explain the details of how that works compared to the other raiding types later on in the tutorial. Once again, neither of these are going to move because they cannot reach the active spot. So now we can move to the fourth step of a launch turn where we check to see if there is a battle on that active spot. A battle is going to happen if there are at least two different factions of ships on that location. And remember, factions include players as well as these raiders over here. It's entirely possible there could be raiders and multiple different players on that location, in which case they'd all be fighting each other at the same time. And I'll explain how that works later on, because as you can see, there is no battle here on our turn. That means we have finished our turn. So play can move clockwise over here to the blue player. For their turn, they're going to launch with this transport and they've decided to head over here to this brown planet. Once they've landed, they must do the action here, and that involves taking this moon token, which shows two titanium resources on it. They can place that into their moon's storage, and with their action done, we can now see that this raider is not going to move because they, just like us, are two spaces away from that raider, and it only has a range of one. So there is no movement there, and there is no battle, which means blue's turn is done. This means we can move to the green player, just like the rest of us, they're starting with a launch action, sending out one transport. But unlike the rest of us, for their first launch, they're going to go onto an Alliance base location, specifically this Odessa field. As you can see out here, we have six different bases that were placed out, and then there are also six planets. The number of planets that are out here depends on the player count. Now, before we continue on with their action, there is something new I'd like to talk about, and that is the fact that each one of the players is controlling an asymmetric faction. As you can see at the start of the game, we each took one of these cards when we put it down. It specifically showed us our starting resources on the back, and each of these dictates various asymmetries that we have. Now, the green player is controlling the Tolzied Porters, and they just activated the pick up and deliver asymmetric effect that's printed on their board. 
When we focus in more, it says whenever they launch to an alliance base, they may immediately spend one credit or two resources of any kinds in order to advance one space on the commerce track. When we focus out, you can see there are various storage spots for resources in the game on these player space station mats. There's energy up here, titanium, nanocarbon, ice, as well as galactic credits. Now, these galactic credits can be spent as if they were ice, titanium, or nanocarbon, so they're nice and flexible. And it is important to note that at the end of your turn, you can only have at most five of the credits, ice, nanocarbon, or titanium, and you can have at most 10 energy. In addition to that, you have to discard tactics cards from your hand down to the minimum, which at the start of the game is five. So in order to activate, pick up, and deliver, they can spend this credit or two other resources, and that's what they've decided to do. They're going to spend an energy and an ice and save this credit for now. Now the progress tracks are over here on the main board, and there are five of them. The commerce track is right over here, and that means the green player can go up once on that track. Now, as you can see, there are numbers to the left side of these tracks, and those are the victory points we will gain at the end of the game if our token is on that specific spot. So, as you can see, green went from the 6-point to the 7-point location, and considering they have that pick-up and deliver action for the entire game, it seems likely they're going to try to use that to get all the way to the top to get those 20 extra points. Now, there are a variety of other effects that show up on the right side of these tracks, and those activate immediately once your token reaches that specific location, and I'll explain what all of these are as we continue through the tutorial. Well, green is done with that asymmetric effect, so now they can move on to their mandatory action, and that's over here at the Odessa Field Alliance base. Now, the first thing that happens when you activate this action is you advance the event track once. That track is right over here. So this will slide forward, and as you can see, there are four more spaces on this track until the token reaches here. Once it reaches there, we're going to reveal an event card, and a variety of things will happen, including having this top tile from the region deck being revealed and added to the board, thus expanding the number of options that we have as we play the game. For now, though, nothing happens. We just advance that token forward once. Next up, green can activate this part of the action, and what that says is they can gain up to two modules. Specifically, those modules are going to be commerce or civilization modules, because those icons are printed on the Odessa field action. When we focus out, you can see there's also the Maximus field base over here, and this is a partner to the Odessa field in that that's the location where you can gain science or industry modules. We can see the modules right up here. So again, the Odessa field has these as options for everyone except for the green player. The reason for that is because they have a trade routes asymmetric effect that says when they gain modules from either of the module fields, they can choose any module types. So instead of being restricted to just these two columns, the green player can purchase from any of these columns. Now that being said, they've actually decided they're going to buy from the commerce column, which anyone can do from the Odessa field. And whenever you take a module from a column, you have to spend the indicated resources that are associated with that module. And if there's a question mark, then that is any resource. Now, they've decided to take this Intelligence Market Commerce module. As you can see, that's going to cost one of their Alliance credits and then one of any other resource. As you can see, they do have a credit to spend. And then for the other resource, they're going to spend one of their energy. Then they can place this module to the right of their player board, specifically in the row that matches up with the color. As you can see, the yellow intelligence market matches up with their yellow treasury. After that, they're going to go up once on the indicated progress track for these yellow modules. That increases their commerce. So this is the second commerce increase green has done on the same turn. And as you can see, when they reach that spot, this is an event track icon that looks just the same as the one that we saw on the Odessa field. So that means they advance the event token once which brings it here. Well, Green has successfully taken a module, and now they have the option of buying one more module, or they could burn a module from those that they have access to, which essentially means they discard it from the game, and then only after they do one of those two options will they slide all of the modules down to fill in gaps, and then they will deal out new modules. Now, as you can see, they have no more credits. Currently, they just have a titanium and an energy. Once again, as the Tolzied Porters, they have access to all of these modules instead of just these two. And yeah, they've decided they're going to buy this Compost Vats module. As you can see, the cost for that is one titanium and then one of any other resource. So they can spend their one titanium and their one energy, which means they've spent all of the resources they began the game with. And then, of course, they can put this industry module into that row. After that, they'll go up once on the industry progress track, which will bring them to here. Now, as you can see at the first advancement on all of these tracks, it shows a level one icon. 
This icon relates to endgame scoring, specifically the amount of points players will get for the five different types of developments that can be constructed out onto the board. Now, I'll explain how that works in more detail later on. For now, though, there is no immediate effect for advancing their token to that specific spot. With that action done, we have to reset all of the module markets by sliding these down to fill in any gaps and then drawing new ones from the respective stacks. Now at this point, I'm sure you're wondering why these modules are important because the green player spent so much resources getting two of them. Don't worry, I'll explain how that works in detail later on. It has to do with returning ships back to space stations and it's likely gonna be a couple of turns until we actually see that happen. Well, green is done with their action, but before we move on with their turn, I now want to talk about these leader tokens over here. At the start of the game, every player put one leader onto each of the six alliance tiles. Now, during a player's turn as a free action, if there are any leader tokens on spaces with ships of that player's color, then for a free action, they can simply take that leader and place it onto the player's board. Leaders start out here on the board and you remove them, and they never find their way back by themselves, but they're very important when it comes to constructing developments, and I'll explain how that works later on. So, green can put their leader over here. As you can see, we all start with one leader in our space station. All right, it's time to see if raiders move. As you can see, this raider is two spaces away, so they are out of range, so there is no movement, and then there is no battle on this spot. That means green is done with their turn. So play is going to move over to us, and now on our turn, we can either launch a ship from our launching bay, or we could return all of our ships back to our space station. We could do that because we do have a ship to return, but I don't think that makes sense right now. Now, technically, before we even make our decision about what we're doing on our turn, we need to take a look at our asymmetric effect. As you can see, we are the Nebulon Cloud people, and we have gas condensers. This says at the beginning of each one of our turns, we gain one energy or one ice if we have at least one ship adjacent to a nebula space. Once again, the nebula spaces are along the top, and that is one of the main reasons why I decided to start over here. We do have a ship adjacent to a nebula, so that is going to activate our gas condensers. So we can gain an ice or an energy, and considering we can only hold at max 5 ice, but we can hold 10 energy, I think energy is what we want to take. So we'll get that as part of our asymmetric effect, and there is another effect that we can activate right now, and that's called Drift. It says at the beginning of our turn, we could spend one of our tactics cards, of which we started the game with three, and then we can move one of our ships onto an adjacent region. Now, if we did this, we would not activate any actions on that spot, but it would change our options when it comes to checking our range. I don't think we want to do this right now, though, so now let's move on with our turn. I do think I want to launch, and because this is not a first launch, that means we have to put this new ship within its range to one of our ships that are already out there on the board. Once again, the range for transports is 1, which means this transport must go over here because that's just one range away from this previously placed ship. If we had multiple ships, then we could choose one range from any one of those specific ships. Now, when we do this, we could actually place this ship down onto a spot that has opposing factions on it. We are only not allowed to do that when we are doing a first jump. So that means if blue had happened to be here instead, we could actually launch onto the spot, then perform our actions, and then have a battle at the end of our turn. That's obviously not the case, though. And I do want to once again say that we cannot go here or there because those are nebula spaces, and our transporters do not have the voyage ability. When we look back at our player board, as you can see, our science vessels do have voyage, but we haven't built any science vessels yet. So this means we have these four options. And of course, if we go here or there, then we're going to be within range one of a raider. They'll move on to our space and attack us, and we will not be at an advantage. So I think realistically, we want to avoid those two spots for now. And instead of going over here and picking up that moon, which is pretty good, I think let's go to the shipyard. Now, as you can see at this alliance base, we have a leader on that spot. So as a free action, we can just take that leader and put them back onto our space station. And I see no reason not to do that right now. Now we can actually perform the action of the shipyard, and what this says is we can either repair or construct a new ship. Now with that repair action, we can repair a ship that's been sent to the scrapyard in a battle. We could instead repair a module that's next to our space station that's already damaged, or we could repair a ship that has taken damage at this point. As you can see, though, we have nothing to repair right now, but I do want to point out that that doesn't mean we can't do a repair action. If you choose a repair action and have nothing to repair, then you instead gain one victory point. Now, I don't think that makes sense for us right now. Instead, let's go ahead and construct a new ship. In order to construct a ship, it has to be off here to the side. As you can see, we have three transports we can construct, as well as one fighter, one science vessel, and one heavy cruiser. 
Now we also have to spend the indicated resources, and I think let's construct our science vessel. As you can see, that's going to cost two nanocarbon and one titanium. We have the titanium here, and we have one nanocarbon, but then we can gain the other one that we need by abandoning this moon. As you can see, that gains us one ice or one nanocarbon. We could do that, of course, just to take the resource and put it over here, or we could just discard this right now, effectively paying for that nanocarbon, and just like that, we now have a science vessel. As you can see, that has the voyage effect, so we can actually send this into one of those nebulas if we want. It also has a range of two, which means we have a lot more flexibility with where we can go with them. And we haven't talked about it just yet, but they roll two dice in combat instead of the one die with those transporters. So the science vessel is all around just better, and I like having the flexibility specifically of that two range. Now we're going to have the science vessel for the rest of the game. We only have to build this once, even if this ends up being destroyed and combat later on, it will still come back to us and be usable in the future. I'll explain how all that works later on though. For now, I'm just happy we have this new ship. Well, we're done with our action, and this is the active spot. It's once again not within range of these raiders, so they don't move, and there is no battle. So, our turn is done, which means the blue player can go. They've decided to launch, and they have a range of one, so they have to go onto one of these spots, and they've decided to go to the development office. Now that does have one of their leaders, so as a free action, they're going to bring that leader onto their station, and then they must perform the develop action. Now the way this works is they have to select one planet that has one of their transporters, and they're going to develop a building on top of that transporter. When we focus out, we can see they only have two transporters out on the map, and one of them is at a base, so that's not even an option. This one is at a planet, so that's the one they must choose. And now what they have to do is spend the indicated resources in order to develop on top of this. In addition to that, they have to have the indicated number of leaders available to them on their space station. When we focus in, in order to develop here, they have to spend two titanium, and they have to have two leaders available. As you can see, they have two titanium here, so they'll spend those, and they have the two leaders, so they have everything that they need. Now, these leaders are going to be permanently removed from the space station, and then they have to take one of the associated tokens from the supply. Now, that planet specifically can only have a factory built onto it, so they can take this factory token, and they will also take a factory card. Next up, they have to take the transport, and as you can see, it is going to snap into the bottom of that factory and be placed back over there. So technically, the transport is the foundation for this development. Then they have to take all of the leaders that were required for this, and they can slot those into the development, as you can see, and they will stay there for the rest of the game. Now, this development is going to provide the blue player with a variety of benefits throughout the game, and the first of those is immediately gaining victory points. Now, every single one of these development cards shows this effect. Specifically, that says they'll gain one point for every leader on that hex, as well as every adjacent hex, up to a maximum of 10 victory points. When we focus out a bit, you can see there are these two leaders on that hex, specifically at the factory, and then there are two leaders over here, two over there, and three over there. So all told, that is nine leaders, which means they immediately got nine victory points for constructing that factory. Blue started the game with two points, so they can add nine to that, bringing them up to 11. Now that does seem great, but remember they built on top of that transporter, which means it is not a ship anymore for the rest of the game. So they've effectively lost an entire ship for use during launch actions. Now the victory points they gained is not the only benefit this will give them. The next of those is going to be victory points at the end of the game. Specifically, every development on the board will be worth points depending on the progress level for that player. When we look at the back of the factory card, you can see it says you score all factories based on the progress on the industry track, and every one of those is worth 0 points if you're not up to level 1, 5 points at 1, 7 points at 2, and 10 points each at level 3. So this is why these icons specifically matter. Because the blue player is at at least level 1, that means that factory they just built is going to be worth at least 5 points to them at the end of the game. But if they're able to get up to the level 2 spot, then every one of those factories is worth an extra 2 points, and of course if they get all the way to the top, then that makes each of them worth 10 points. Having points is how you win the game, but there's even more benefits for having that development. One of them comes into play in combat, and I'll explain how that works later on, but another one involves this icon right here. That says they're going to advance once on that indicated progress track, and then they're going to keep this card with this side face up in front of them until they choose to gain this ability printed down here. That is a once per game effect. Once they use this, they'll flip the card over, and then this is again just a reminder for end game scoring. 
Now, specifically, that says at any point during their turn as a free action, they can flip this over to get two free repair actions. Now, we'll talk about repairing in more detail later on. For now, they do have to advance once on that industry track. And as you can see, when they do that, they've reached a spot with a bonus icon. Now, let's focus in. This is the Starship Upgrade icon, and that means Blue can immediately upgrade one of their Starships. The way this works is Blue can take one of their upgrade tiles and place it face up onto their station. Now, I haven't talked about these just yet. During setup, every single player gained a random fighter upgrade, heavy cruiser upgrade, transport upgrade, and science vessel upgrade. We all have one of each of these, and then another asymmetric effect of these faction boards is we get a specific upgrade. For the blue player, they're playing as the Mecheron Synthborn, and their special upgrade is called Terminator, which is a fighter upgrade. That's this upgrade right here. And again, they have all of these at their disposal, and they can now choose one of them and place it onto their space station. After considering their options, they've decided to go with the special one associated with their faction. That is the Terminator. And as you can see, it has the same icons as this fighter spot. So they can just cover that up. And that has now changed their fighters. When we focus in, you may notice that the range is the same and the number of attack dice is the same, but there is this indestructible effect that says at the end of every one of their turns, if their ship is in the scrapyard, they may return it to their launch bay. So this is a very durable fighter. Now again, we'll talk about battles and the scrapyard in more detail later on, but before we move away from here, there's one last part to the ship upgrade, and that involves, for free, gaining one of that ship. So by taking this Terminator upgrade, they automatically get a fighter, and it is specifically their Terminator. That essentially saved them an energy as well as a titanium, as well as having to do an action that allows you to build a spaceship. So by developing, they lost one of their spaceships, but they've also essentially gained one because of a chain of bonuses from constructing that factory development. Now, before we move on with the tutorial, I'd like to show you the upgrades that we started the game with. Obviously, we haven't had a chance to make any of these happen just yet, but it's fun to see our options. Now, the one associated with the Nebulon Cloud people is Cloud Scrapers. This actually upgrades our transport. It gives it a range of two, which is great. Normally, they have a range of one, and we do have several transports at our disposal. This also adds the Voyage effect to each of our transports. Voyage lets us travel onto Nebula spaces, which is certainly a nice thing to have. Now, the rest of these are one per different type that we randomly got, and one of them is, of course, a transport upgrade. It's important to note that if we upgrade into this transport upgrade, later on we could do this one instead. We would just discard the previous one and put the new one onto it. Now, this one is turbo transports. As you can see, it's very similar to our cloud scrapers. It increases the range by one. Our cloud scrapers are strictly better, though, so there's no world where we do this one instead of that one. After that, we have a defender. Now, this upgrades our fighter, but it adds a shield onto it, so it'll actually take two damage before it's destroyed, and I'll explain how damage works later on in the tutorial. We also have a Lunar Explorer. This is our science vessel upgrade, and it increases the number of dice it rolls by one, so three instead of two, and it has this scanner's effect that says when you claim a moon with this ship, you may immediately gain the benefit of the token without discarding it. So that is a really good way to pick up resources as we go. The final upgrade we have is Blaster, which is our heavy cruiser upgrade, and that increases the range from one to two, and the dice rolled from three to five. So this ship is very good in battle. Now, speaking of the heavy cruiser, they also have this jump effect, which I haven't described just yet. Now, this jump effect says that whenever you launch with a heavy cruiser, you can spend one energy to jump to any spot on the board. It does not matter what the range is. As you can see, heavy cruisers are normally slow with a range of one, but by spending an energy, they can go anywhere. Well, at this point, Blue is done with a huge turn, and now we can see that the Raiders will not advance because this is the active spot, and that is out of range. There is no battle to happen right over here, so now we can move from the Blue player's turn back over to the Green player. For their turn, they've decided to keep things pretty simple. They're going to launch, they have to go next to this previously placed ship, and they're going to go over here. Once they arrive, their action is going to be taking this moon, which shows a credit icon and they can place that into their moon's storage. After that, no raiders can reach this active spot, and there is no battle, so that finished a quick turn for green, which means it's time for us to go. Now, at the beginning of our turn, our gas condensers are going to activate, because we do still have at least one ship adjacent to a nebula. That means we gain an energy or an ice, and I think we're going to gain another energy. And then for our turn, 
I think let's use our brand new science vessel with its voyage ability, and we're going to head into this nebula here. Remember, you must have the voyage effect in order to go into any of these nebula spots. The science vessel does have a range of two, so technically we could go um, over here if we wanted to, but I think I like this spot better. Now it's time for actions, and as a free action, we can bring both of these leaders back to our space station. Uh, they were put here during setup, and having these is going to increase our flexibility when it comes to actually building those developments, which we haven't actually gotten to yet, even though the blue player has already built one. Next up for the action in this area, if there is a nebula moon token over here, then we get to take it. If there isn't a nebula moon token, then we simply don't get that benefit. So this is a perk for being the first player to visit this location. In general, these nebula moons are more powerful than the standard moons, and we can now place this one into our storage. After that, we can perform the main action that shows up in all of the nebula spots, and that is prescience. This lets us potentially modify the upcoming event. The way this works is we get to draw the top two event cards, and we get to choose one of them to go on top of the deck, and the other one will go down to the bottom. Remember, as soon as this token reaches the end, we will then reveal the top event card at the end of that player's turn, and then we'll do what that event says. So we actually have some control about what the next event will be. Now there's a decent amount going on with these event cards. The first is scoring. We're going to score points based off of our progress level on specific progress tracks, and this also defines new raiders that come out onto the board. In addition to that, there are special effects that happen. We can see this special effect says, in turn order, each player may select and gain one new science or industry module at no cost, and refill after each selection, whereas this one has a special effect. Each player gains one nanocarbon, then put one bonus nanocarbon on the newly placed planet, and one on each adjacent region. Now, as part of the event, we're going to put a new planet down onto the board, and that's where the nanocarbon will go. Now, I'll explain the finer details about this event once it actually happens, but I like this close encounter. So we're going to put that on top of the deck, and we'll put the other one to the bottom, so we now know what the next event is going to be, but of course our opponents don't. And that could change. If one of our opponents does a prescience action before the event happens, then they could potentially get rid of the event that we just put at the top. Currently, we're the only ones with a voyage ability, though, so I think the odds of that happening before this first event is revealed is pretty unlikely. Well, we're now done with our action, so now we have the Raider's Strike step, and as you can see, there is a Raider that is within range of the active region. That means this Raider is going to strike by moving into that region, and that means we are going to have a battle here. Now, before we move on to the battle step, I want to explain a couple more details about the Raider's Strike step. Now, there are a variety of different Raider types. These right here are Strikers. Now, Strikers have a special effect called Swarm, and that means multiple Strikers can be in the same area. That means if this Raider had happened to be here already, and the situation looked like this, then both of these Strikers would enter this area before the battle actually happened. However, if we had a situation like this, where there are two different raider types that have range to the active area, then in this case, the active player would decide which of the raiders is going to move in here, because you cannot have multiple different types of raiders on that specific spot. So we could choose to have this one go, or that one, and obviously we'd pick the one that made more sense for our current situation. This ion storm is scary, so fortunately we don't have to fight against that right now. Once again, this raider is going to strike, and now we can move into the first battle step of the game. Once again, a battle is happening because there is more than one faction within the active area spot. It's possible there could even be more than two factions like this, in which case all of us would be fighting at the same time. That's not the case right now, though. So now we can move on to the first battle. Now, every battle takes place over six phases that we perform in order, and the first phase is called Escalation. The way this works is in turn order, beginning with the active player. Each player may engage starships within range, moving them into this active region. Now, the way this works is you simply take as many starships as you want that are not in the active area, but have a range into the active area, and you move them into there. That means if we wanted to, we can move this transport into the active area to help participate in battle, because it has a range of one, and the battle is one away. I do think we want to do that, so let's move this transporter right over here. But it's worth noting we can't engage this one into the battle, because of course that is range two away, and our transporters only have a range of one. Now this happens in turn order starting with us, so that means after us, potentially the blue player could engage into this battle if they wanted to, if they had any ships that were within range. Obviously in this case they don't. After that, green could do this, but again, they don't have any ships within range, so they don't have a decision to make there. With the escalation phase done, we can now move to the second phase, which is called diplomacy. 
The way this works is in turn order, beginning with the active player. Each player in the battle may pass or play exactly one Diplomacy Tactics card from their hand. At the start of the game, everyone got three random Tactics cards from the deck, and Diplomacy cards look like this. As you can see, it says Diplomacy there in the middle. Now, randomly, we got these three at the start, and one of them is a Diplomacy card. As you can see, that says at the end of the Diplomacy phase, we draw three Tactics cards. I think that's a great idea. It's our only Diplomacy, so let's go ahead and play this. And after that, if other players were in this battle, then in turn order, they could optionally play up to exactly one Diplomacy card into the battle. These can really change things up, including potentially just stopping the battle from happening entirely. It just depends on the Diplomacy cards that are played. In this case, we're the only player here, so obviously that's the only Diplomacy card that can be played. So now it will activate. We can discard this one and then draw three random Tactics cards from the top of the deck. These are the three cards we drew. One of them is another Diplomacy, but remember, you can only play one Diplomacy per battle. This one specifically says if we had played it, then the battle ends. We then move one of our ships from the active region to any planet or alliance base. So this is exactly what I was talking about, where a battle could stop before it even begins because of Diplomacy. Well, we now have five Tactics cards in our hand, which is certainly great, and now we can move on to the Battle Preparations phase. And during this phase, in turn order starting with the active player, players are going to establish how many weapons dice they are going to roll and their targeting value. In this phase, we can also play Tactics cards that are relevant, and we can divert energy to our weapons. Now, let's start things off by figuring out how many weapons dice we are rolling already. In order to do this, we have to look at the ships that are currently in the battle, and for us, that's our Science Vessel and one Transport. With that in mind, we can look at our space station and then add up the dice that show up on those specific ships. Our science vessel adds two weapons dice and our transports add one. So that means right now we are rolling three weapons dice. Players have up to six weapons dice that they can roll though within every battle. So that means we could potentially roll more. Now, as I said, you can divert energy into weapons by spending one energy to add a weapon die into the battle. Currently, we have four energy, so if we wanted to roll all six dice, we could spend three energy right now to add those in. Another option in this phase involves playing tactics cards that apply to this phase. Now, those look like these. For example, we have Perfect Shot, but this says play after battle dice have been rolled. This card counts as an additional six. We haven't rolled our dice yet, though, so that doesn't make sense. And then this is a secret weapon. That says we can play on any player's turn during a battle preparation step, and that gives us two more weapons dice, and it increases our targeting by one. Now, I haven't described targeting just yet, and don't worry, I'll get to that soon. So, again, we could spend this right now to get two extra dice, but part of me feels like we want to hold onto this for a moment when it's better in the future. This is a really good secret weapon. So let's not play either of these, but I do think let's spend one energy to add a weapons die. I think four dice is going to be good for us in this battle. All right, we can now move into the fourth battle phase where we are going to roll battle dice. The way this works is all of the dice that were prepared are going to be rolled simultaneously. And in this battle, we are fighting against a single Vorticon Striker. As you can see, they roll two dice in battle, so that means we can roll two of these Raider dice. Okay, now it's time to roll all the dice simultaneously. Now, at this point, we can look at the dice faces, and it's time to talk about targeting. Now, targeting is an important concept that has to do with the number of ships a faction has in the battle. As you can see, in this battle, we have two ships. That means our targeting value is two. It's possible to increase the targeting value through other effects, like this secret weapon. If we had played this, that would have added another one to our targeting value, giving us a targeting value of three, but of course we decided not to play this. Now the reason we care about targeting is because it establishes a minimum value for all of the dice that we roll. In this case, we have targeting of two, which means we have a minimum value of two, and as you can see with this die roll, we rolled a couple of ones. Now, all of the dice that meet or exceed the targeting value can simply be set aside, but then all dice that are below the targeting value must be re-rolled, and if we roll more ones in this case, we'll continue to re-roll those. So functionally, we're going to keep re-rolling dice until every one of the dice in the battle meets or exceeds our targeting value. In this case, that means we can roll these, and we got a 5 and a 3. Those both meet or exceed our targeting value, so we can add those onto the board. As you can see, targeting essentially gives you a floor for your dice. If we had four ships in this battle, then every die would have a minimum value of 4, and we'd re-roll everything that was below a 4. Now, it is worth noting that the maximum targeting value is 5. So if you happen to have 6 ships in a battle, you still have a targeting value of 5, which means all of the dice that you roll will end up being 5s or 6s. Well, at this point, we're done rolling and re-rolling dice, so we can move into the fifth step where we determine the winner. 
The way this works is for every faction in the battle, we're going to find their single highest value die and compare those. In this case, the raiders got a 6 and we got a 5. And if nothing else happened in this moment, we would simply lose the entire battle because the 6 is better than our 5. Now, I really don't want to lose this battle. And because of that, I think it's time to bring out this perfect shot tactics card that we had in our hand. As you can see, it says we play this after battle dice have been rolled, and this card counts as an additional result of a six. So we can play this out, and that six is going to equalize out with this six, which means there is a tie for the best die. That means we now move to the next best die. In this case, that is going to be a five for the Raiders and a five for us, where we once again have a tie. So we once again move to the next best die. We have another five and the Raiders don't have any other dice. This means we have five against nothing, which means we win this fight just barely because of that perfect shot. That means this can be discarded. And before we move on, I do want to once again point out that there's a possibility of having more than two factions in a battle. There could be all four factions within a single battle, and after the dice are rolled, you simply compare the highest die for all of the factions, and you keep going down until a single faction has the highest value die. It's worth noting if there is a full tie with the dice, then everybody is considered to be losers, and no one is the winner. That's obviously not the case here. We ended up winning this battle which means we can now advance up once on the Supremacy track. As you can see, this is not associated with any specific modules. The main way you go up this is by winning battles, as well as by constructing obelisk developments. So we can go up once, and as you can see, that shows a level 1 obelisk, which means if we happen to construct any obelisk developments before the end of the game, then they'll now be worth at least 5 points for us. As you can see, the next step on the Supremacy track for us will advance the event track, and the step after that one has a Supremacy token. We randomly place these out at the start of the game, and the first person to go here gains this. As you can see, that is a Starship upgrade action that looks exactly the same as that icon over there. Once these are gone, if anybody else advances to that spot, they simply gain two victory points. Now the next thing that happens is if the winner was a player faction and there was a raider within the losing faction, then the winning player will gain the reward printed on the raider's card. When we focus in, we can see the reward is going to be gaining one new tactics card per raider in the battle. There was one raider, so we can draw one card. Ooh, we got another diplomacy. That one says it's a trap. It says we can play this one and then each opponent is going to damage one of their ships in the active region and then we can draw a new tactics card. Now I'll talk about damage in more detail very soon, but before we get there I want to talk a little bit more about losing a battle. Now any players that were in a battle that lost are going to gain a consolation prize. Specifically that has to do with their tactical operations effect. And this allows all losing players to draw a single tactics card from the top of the deck, or they can gain a benefit that's slotted in here with a moon token. Now, as a free action on any player's turn, they can always take a moon from their moon storage and put it onto a moon slotted spot. So, for example, if we had just lost, we could have slotted this in right here, and then, as a tactical operation effect, gained a credit and an energy, even though we'd lost the battle. After we slot a moon in, it is committed to that location. We are allowed to remove it, but it's discarded from the game. However, that does open the slot up for a different moon token. All players start with the same tactical operations effect. Well, we've reached the sixth and final phase of battle where damage is going to be applied. The way this works is all ships of losing factions take one damage. To further explain this, let's pretend we had lost this battle. In that case, both our science vessel and our transport would take one damage. And the moment that happens, each of those ships will become destroyed. The reason for that is because neither of them have shields. Now, at the start of the game, all players' heavy cruisers have shields, as you can see with that icon there. If a ship with shields in battle takes a damage, then you can put one damage cube right there, and then if it takes another damage before this is repaired off, then that ship will be destroyed. So that means we wouldn't even need these damage cubes for our transport and science vessel taking damage, because one damage is enough to destroy them. Now, whenever a ship is destroyed, you place it into the scrapyard over here on this sideboard. Now, ships in the scrapyard will come back to us in the future, but they will not be able to activate any of our modules. As you can see, you can use repair actions to take a ship from your scrapyard and move it to the repair barge, where when it returns to us, it can activate a module, and that is certainly a good thing. Now, I haven't described how activating modules works in detail yet, and don't worry, I'll get to that soon. Of course, that was just an example. In reality, we won this battle. Since the Raiders lost, that means they will take one damage, and these Vorticon Strikers do not have shields. 
One thing they do have is that swarm ability, though. I want to point out that if both of these were in the battle, then only one of these would be destroyed. We would not do damage to both, and that's just part of their swarm ability. Obviously, that's not the case, though. And this raider was indeed destroyed with that one damage. So we can place it over here, back in the supply, and it might come out again later on due to an event. All right, battle is done, and that means our turn is coming to a close. I do want to point out once again that at the end of a turn, we have to discard down to our maximums, and when it comes to cards, we have one, two, three, four, five. Now, five is the initial hand limit, and I want to point out that you can increase your hand limit of tactics cards by progressing up on the civilization track. Once you get to this spot, you can hold six cards, and once you get to that spot, you can hold seven. I also want to point out that as a part of this effect, you get to draw cards until you reach your hand size. Well, with our turn done, play now moves to the blue player. For their turn, they've decided to launch with their indestructible fighter. Now, it has a range of two, and they're going to use that range to go two away from what is currently their only ship out on the board, and they're going to go to the Maximus field. As soon as they go there as a free action, they're going to bring this leader to their space station, and then they do have to advance the event track once. That's going to bring it here. So we're just two event icons away from the first event happening. After that, they can activate the Maximus Field effect, and that lets them take up to two Science or Industry modules. In this case, they've actually decided to take both of these down here, which are the cheapest. Now, this one is going to cost them a Nanocarbon and one resource of their choice, and that one's going to cost them a Titanium and one resource of their choice. As you can see, they have a Nanocarbon, and they're also going to spend one Ice, so that is going to pay for this Science module. But then for this one, they need a titanium and one of any resource. And as you can see, they don't have any titanium. Now, if they want, they could spend this getting them to titanium, or they could use synthesize one of their asymmetric effects. As you can see, it says they may freely exchange their titanium and energy for each other. In addition to that, they have the recharge effect that says each time one of their ships goes to the scrapyard because it was destroyed, they gain one energy. So because of Synthesize, they can turn this energy into a Titanium effectively, and then they'll spend the other energy to pay for the other resource, which could have been any type. Now they can place this over here, and of course, as they place these down, they're going to advance once on the indicated tracks. Before we get there, though, I want to point out this icon here. Now, some modules come into play damaged. This means it's not actually activatable right now, and all damaged modules lose a player two victory points at the end of the game, so that's certainly not good. Fortunately, players can use a repair action, as you can see, to remove a damage from a module. All right, now they can advance up on the tracks. That's once for science and once for industry. As you can see, when blue advances science once, that hits an event icon, and when they advance industry once, that's another event icon. So the event tracker will go over twice, and as soon as it reaches this spot, you actually remove that token and put it in front of the player whose turn it currently is. That's there to remind them that they must activate the next event once their turn is over. However, before moving on with their turn, the blue player must now immediately draw a new region tile and place it onto the board. In this case, that is a blue planet, and they must place this down onto an empty region on the board that's touching at least one other region tile. After thinking it through, they're going to place over here. Next up, they have to randomly take three moon tokens that are associated with that planet type, in this case blue, and then put them face up on top of that region. Well, blue is done with their actions, so now we can refresh these markets. And now it's time for the raider strike step of their launch turn. This raider is within one range of the active spot, so it is going to strike. And then after that, we can see there is going to be a battle between the blue player with their single fighter against that Vorticon striker. So let's go through the battle. The first thing is escalation, and the blue player does not have any ships that they can bring into the spot within range, and it looks like none of their opponents do either. After that, if blue wants, they could play up to one diplomacy card but it doesn't look like they're going to do that, so now they can move on to battle preparation. Now, in this step, they can divert energy in order to charge up their weapons and play tactics cards, and in addition to that, they can gain weapons dice from developments that are out here on the board. Every development, regardless of type, is going to add one weapon die to every battle within range one of it. So that's another reason Blue decided to place this here. That means for the rest of the game, every battle they participate in on these spots that are within range one, they will roll an extra die. So that means currently they have plus one die from this, and then of course they roll their standard dice from their Terminator fighter. 
And as you can see, that is two dice. So they're currently rolling two plus one from the development, which is three, and they could spend energy, or I guess in their case, titanium, in order to power up their weapons. Because remember, for them, they can spend their titanium as if it was energy, and their energy as if it was titanium. They don't have any energy or titanium right now, although they could spend this to get two titanium to then convert into energy using their asymmetric effect. But it looks like they're not going to do that. Now, they, of course, can spend cards, but it looks like they're not going to do that. So they can now move on to the roll battle step where they're going to roll all three of these dice. Of course, they're going to add in two of these dice for that Vorticon Striker, and now they can roll all of them. As you can see, the blue player got a six, a four, and a one, and the raider got a six and a five. Now, the targeting value for blue is one because they have only one ship here, and they did not gain any plus two targeting effects from anything else. Since their targeting is 1, that means the minimum value for the dice is 1, which means they don't get any rerolls. Now they can compare the dice. The raider got a 6, and they have a 6, so that's a tie. So they can move on to their next strongest die. The raider has a 5, and they have a 4. Now that means the raider is currently winning, and of course the blue player could potentially play cards in this moment if they had cards that applied in order to try and swing the battle, but they're not going to do that. This means the raider wins the battle, and blue is the loser. Because they lost, blue can now activate their tactical operations. That means they can draw a new tactics card from the deck, or they could activate a moon that's slotted over here. Remember, slotting moons in is a free action, and if they wanted to, they could slot this in and immediately gain two titanium as a constellation prize for losing this battle. I think they've decided to do that, so they're going to activate this moon that's been slotted in and gain two titanium from their tactical operations. After that, their Terminator is going to take one damage. As you can see, it does not have a shield, so that means it will be destroyed, which will move it over to the scrapyard. Now, that's where it would normally stay. However, that is a Terminator fighter. It has the indestructible effect that says at the end of the blue player's turn, if this ship is in the scrapyard, it may be returned to your launch bay. So, blue's going to activate that, which brings it back, and they can put it over here, where they could once again use it on their next turn, even though it lost that battle, because again, it's indestructible. So, as you can see, this is a pretty strong effect they were able to upgrade into. Before we move on, I do also want to point out that these have the attack effect down here, and that simply means that when they do a first launch, which means they have no ships out there on the board, if they do it with one with the attack, they could actually first launch onto a location that has opposing faction figures on it. Remember, normally during first launch, you have to go into a spot that does not have any. Well, Blue's turn is coming to an end, and that means it's now time for them to place this back on the board and activate the first event of the game. The token's going to go down here because it's a three-player game, and then they'll reveal this card, which of course is a surprise to everyone but us. Now the first thing that happens is an immediate scoring based on one of the progress tracks. For Close Encounter, that shows the Commerce track. This means all players are going to score points equal to their position on that track, but they lose one point for every Commerce module they have that is currently damaged. It doesn't look like any of us have damaged commerce modules. So we'll just get the points listed here. This worked out really well for green. They are going to gain 8 points, which brings them up to 11. And then blue is going to gain 5, which brings them to 16. And we will gain 5, which brings us to 6. After scoring, the next thing that happens is we add a new raider to the board. Now the type of raider added is indicated on the card. In this case, that is type B. So we can put that card face up next to the board and then place it according to the listed condition at the top. This says the Saucerian Abductor begins on a random nebula space. You may have noticed these die icons on the six nebula spots, and those are used when we have to randomly add a raider down. In this case, we rolled a 2, so that means the Saucerian Abductor is going to show up on nebula location 2. The next thing that happens is abduct. That says when this raider comes into play, each player must move two of their leaders from any regions onto this card. This happens in player order, and blue has decided to move these two leaders from that nebula onto the card. Then green gets to choose, and they're going to do the same thing. And then, of course, we have to, and I think we'll send this leader as well as that one. We can place those onto the abductor card, and as you can see, there is a rescue effect. That says the player who destroys this raider gets all of their leaders from the card. Then all other players get one of those leaders. The reward over here says you rescue leaders. So the only way to get some or all of these back is by defeating that raider. I do want to point out that that raider has a longer range than the strikers do. It has a range of two, and it does roll four dice. 
Well, after adding the Raider, it's now time to activate the special effect. That says, in turn order, each player may select and gain a new science or industry module at no cost. You refill after each selection. This begins with the active player, and that is the blue player. And they've decided to take this Algae Agitator. That is going to increase them once on the green track, and it gives them effect that lets them spend a nanocarbon for one energy and one credit when they activate this after returning to their station. Once again, I haven't described that in detail yet, but I'll get to that soon. So they can place this over here in line with their other green modules, and then advance once on the science progress track. When they do that, they reach this location, and that lets them take a discovery token. A stack of five was randomly placed here and there at the start of the game, and they can look through all of these and choose the one they want, and then activate that as a free action at some point later on when they want the effect that's listed. They've decided to keep this one, and the rest will go back here. Obviously, if somebody else reaches this spot, then they can choose from the slightly smaller stack. That's finished Blue's selection, so this is going to slide down, and a new one comes out, and now Green can select any of these for free. And they've decided to take this one here. That is going to advance them once on the industry track, which is pretty important. That'll let them immediately do a starship upgrade. And of course, they also place this next to their space station. It's going to go right over here. And it's important to note that it does come in damaged. And now the green player can activate this effect from advancing on the industry track. That lets them upgrade one of their starships. So they can select one of these from their personal area. And just like the blue player earlier on, they've decided to go with the one that's specific to their asymmetric faction. This is the Merchant Skarn, which they can place onto their heavy cruiser spot. Now, if you remember from before, every time you upgrade a starship type as a bonus, you get it for free so they can gain it immediately into their launch bay. And as you can see, it has some effects. Now, its range is 2 compared to the normal range of 1 for these heavy cruisers, but then it rolls 3 dice, which is normal. It is worth noting it lost the shield effect, so that means this gets destroyed with just 1 damage, unlike normally taking 2 damage before it's destroyed. Down below, both of these have the jump effect, which I've already described, but then the Merchant Skarn has the profiting effect, and that says whenever they launch this ship to an Alliance base, they gain one credit. If you remember from before, their pickup and deliver effect says whenever they launch to an Alliance base, they could spend a credit to advance once on the Commerce track, so that means if they do that with this Merchant Skarn, they automatically get the credit, so it's effectively for them like getting a free Commerce advancement every time they launch their Merchant to an Alliance base. That's finished Green's pick, so that means finally we get to pick one of these. And I like the idea of this aluminum smelter, so we're going to take that. It will then advance us once on the industry track, which unfortunately doesn't get us any goodies, but we're one step away from getting our own Starship upgrade. We can of course slide these down, and then add this brown module over here next to our other brown module. This one does unfortunately come in damaged, so we can keep that in mind when we have an opportunity to repair. Well, at this point, we have finished resolving the event, and that means the blue player's turn is now over. All right, it's time for green to go. They've decided to launch with their turn, and they're going to use their Merchant Skarn. That has a range of two. Although in this case, they've decided to go to the shipyard, which only uses a range of one. They're still happy with that, though. So after arriving as a free action, they can return this leader to their board. And then Merchant Skarn's profiteering effect will come into play, which says whenever they send this specific ship to an Alliance base, they gain one credit. After that, they can use Pick Up and Deliver, where they can spend one credit or two of any other resources to advance once on the Commerce Track, once again, when they launch to an Alliance base. They are going to do that, so they can spend the credit they just got which will yet again advance them on the Commerce Track. Now, by doing that, they've reached a new icon, and this is an endgame scoring icon. This says at the end of the game, they will now get one point for every access resource they have, and that does include tactics cards. Those are considered to be resources. That means before you get to this spot, all excess resources are worth nothing at the end of the game, but now the green player has to consider those resources as points. If they get up here, which seems likely, then every excess resource will be worth two points to them at the end of the game. Next up, they have to activate the action at the shipyard. That lets them either create a new ship or do a repair action. In this case, they've decided to repair. Whenever you do a repair action, you can take one damage off of a module or a ship that has shields. For example, if it looked like this, you could repair that damage off. Or if you had a ship in the scrapyard, you could use the repair action to move them down here, which is the repaired barge. 
In this case, Green has decided they want to repair this damage off, and that's important because you cannot use modules while they are damaged. So with that gone, they can now use their cyborg assembly. All right, their action is done, and now when we move to the Raider's Strike step, we can see that this Saucerian Abductor is within range because it has a range of two. So that means it is going to move all the way over here, and now it's pretty obvious we're going to have a battle with three factions in it. Well, the first step of battle is escalation, and starting with the active player, they can escalate by moving ships into the active region as long as those ships have range. Their transports have a range of one, so that means this one can escalate in, and they've decided to do it. After that, we get to decide if we want to join up here. Now, this transport can't reach there, but our science vessel does have a range of two, so we could send it over there if we want. Now, here's the problem. If we lose this, all of our ships will be damaged, and in our case, none of them have shields, so they'll be destroyed. I'd kind of like our science vessel not to be destroyed for reasons that we'll see soon, and I'm not feeling super confident we'll win this, but we do have another trick up our sleeve, specifically with diplomacy, where we can just end the battle before it even happens. Yeah, I think we are not going to escalate, and after that, it is the diplomacy step. We do this in player order, so green can decide if they want to put a diplomacy card in, but it looks like they haven't. Remember, every one of these cards is now worth one point to them at the end of the game. After that, in turn order, we can, and we have this one that says it's a trap. It says each opponent damages one of their ships in the active region, and then we can draw a tactics card. But I think we are just going to stop this one with our diplomacy. We're going to go for a bargain for safe passage, and this says the battle ends immediately. We move one of our ships from the active region to any planet or alliance base, although this is not a launch action, which means we won't do an action after we move it. So we're going to reveal that, and what looked like a big battle is now actually not going to happen. We do get to move one of our ships to any alliance base or planet, though, and I think we're going to move this ship over to the Monolith of Ancients. Once again, we don't activate this when we arrive, although I do want to point out how the Monolith of Ancients action works. Specifically, this says you can spend two of any resource in order to draw three cards. Remember, cards are resources, so you can spend two cards to get three cards if you wanted to as your action on that turn. I think now is also a good time to talk about the Trade Hub, which works a lot like the Monolith of Ancients, and we haven't seen it activated so far. Now, the action here says you spend two of any resources in order to gain two credits, and this is a nice, reliable way to gain credits, which are a great resource to have for a variety of reasons in the game. Well, it looks like that battle ended early through diplomacy, and that means the green player's turn is done. With this Saucerian abductor here in the middle of the board, though, I think it's going to be getting into a battle sooner rather than later, because with a range of two, it reaches just about every single spot on the board. Well, green's turn is done, so we can go, and we can start by activating our gas condensers. We have at least one ship next to at least one nebula spot, so that means we can take an ice or an energy, and I think we'll take another energy. Now we can perform our turn, and if we want to, we could launch this transport, which is currently our last ship in our loading bay, or we could just do a return to station action right now if we wanted to. Honestly, I think that makes sense. There is something to be said for sending out all of our ships before we return with them, but by returning, we'll gain access to our science vessel sooner, and then we can continue to use it to chart out these nebulas and gain these really good nebula moon tokens before our opponents can. Yeah, I think we're going to return to our station. Now, a return to station turn has three steps to it, and the first one involves activating modules. Now, in order to do this, we have to spend energy or activate them with ships that are returning. Now, over the course of this action, every ship everywhere, including the scrapyard, is going to be returned to our launch bay, but we're going to do this in steps. Now, in this first step, we can return all ships that are not in the scrapyard, so that does include ships over here on the repair barge. As you can see, we have three of those, and we'll start by returning this science vessel. Now what we can do with this vessel is activate a module. Specifically, every module can be activated by a ship that's returning or one energy. However, the first time any module of a specific color in a row is activated, it must be activated with a ship. So that means we have to begin with this, and I think we're going to head right over here onto the shipwright spot. As soon as we place it down, we gain the effect that's printed. In this case, that means we can either make a new ship or we can do a repair action. I think we are going to repair because that lets us repair this damage off our aluminum smelter module, which means it's now available for us to use. Now, since we sent a ship to this column, that means we could activate other modules in this column with energy if we wanted to, or we could send more ships onto these spots if we wanted to. I think before we do any of that, though, I now want to slot a moon. Specifically, you may have noticed this moon symbol here that's the combination of two of our industry modules. Every time two industry modules are touching, it creates a new slot, and I think 
we're going to take our one moon token and we're going to put it right there. Now that is going to activate as soon as both of the adjacent industry modules are activated during a return to station action. And obviously we've activated one of those already. Now let's activate this one. And I think we're going to do that by spending an energy. And that is going to immediately get us one ice and a titanium as well as activating this moon that's in between. So that's another credit and another energy. Overall, not bad. <laughs> After that, we can return another ship, and we can only activate modules that have not been activated already. So we have these three options here. Now, I do want to point out the green modules because they work a little different than the rest. The rest of these modules each individually have to be activated. However, for the green, once you activate this one right here, it's going to activate every single green module that we have. So for example, if we had this here and we activated our primary reactor, we'd get two energy and then we'd also activate this cryo chamber. So effectively, you only ever activate your green row once. And of course, since it's the first activation on that row, you must do this with a ship. Now, I do want to point out this icon here. Whenever you activate that, all players gain the associated resource, including the active player. So once again, if I activated this with a ship, I'd get three energy and everyone, including us, would gain one ice. Of course, we don't have this cryo chamber right now, but we could still go here to get two energy if we wanted to. Another option is going here to the treasury. That would just get us a credit, but credits are great to have. And then finally, this architect here says we could activate it to gain one card, or we could do a development action. That works exactly like the action over here for the development office. So that means if we still had a transport in a legal spot that we could afford, we could activate that architect to develop during this recall action. Currently, we only have a transport here on the monolith of ancients. Obviously, you cannot build developments on these alliance bases, but if that was there, for example, and we had two credits, then we could build a spaceport onto that spot. Of course, that's not the case, though. So I think we'll just go to the treasury with this ship, and that'll get us a credit. And then with our final ship returning, I think we're just going to activate our primary reactor. That's going to get us two more energy. And now we're done activating our modules. Remember, we can spend energy to activate modules, but you have to activate a row first before you can do that. So obviously we cannot use this to activate the architect because the row has not been activated by a ship. Overall, I think we did pretty well, though, and as you can see, as you build up more of these modules and as you get a bigger fleet, you can activate more of them getting this stuff. Of course, the longer you go before you recall these ships, the more of these activations you can do. But again, it's also important that these ships cannot come from the scrapyard. I mentioned before that I was worried about sending our science vessel into that battle because it might be destroyed. And if that had happened, we would not have the science vessel right now to activate a module. Once we're done activating modules, we then take the rest of our ships that could be over here in the scrapyard, and we're going to place those into our loading dock, as well as all of the ships that we use to activate the modules. We can also clear this energy off, and it's important to note that when these ships come back, you also repair any damage that might be on them. So if we had a damaged heavy cruiser and it returned, we just repair that automatically. So, as you can see, you always get your ships back, even if they're destroyed and in that scrapyard. You just can't use those scrapyard ships to activate these modules, and these modules are a big way that we get resources in the game. Well, that's finished our return to station action. That means it's time for the blue player to go. Now, before they do anything, I want to correct a quick mistake. On a previous turn, they did have their Terminator be destroyed, which means it went to the scrapyard briefly before it got brought back using their indestructible effect. And that should have activated their recharge effect that says each time one of their ships goes into the scrapyard, they gain one energy. So technically, they should have gained an energy when that happened. Now it's time for them to perform their turn, and it looks like they're going to launch. If they returned their ships to their station, well, they only have one ship to return because another one of their transports that they sent out turned into a development. Now, if they did this, they could go onto one of these spots to activate, in particular their primary reactor, although their Heisenberg compensator is currently damaged, so that wouldn't activate. So that doesn't feel very good to them. I do want to point out they have this dynamic mechanism. Now that has a slot on it, and if you slot something in, like let's pretend they hadn't used this yet, as soon as you slot that over there, it covers the two victory point symbol, so that would give them two victory points, and then when they activate this for the rest of the game, it would get them the resources that are depicted. Because they have this dynamic mechanism, it's likely they are on the hunt for a good moon that they could slot in over there. Well, they're now going to launch with their Terminator. And with it, they're going to land over here onto this planet. They have a range of two, but they only need a range of one right now. After they land, they can take this, which is a pretty good moon that they might consider slotting into that industry module I pointed out. And then after that, it looks like the Caesarian abductor is within range, so it is going to strike. That has started a battle, so now escalation begins. 
If Blue wants, they could bring this transport in, and they've decided to do that. Next up, if Green wants, they could join in this battle, and their heavy cruiser does have a range of two, so it could reach. That being said, it does not have a shield, and they've decided they don't want to chance it, so they're not going to escalate in. We have no ships at all out here, so we can't join in, so that means Blue can continue into the diplomacy step. They're not going to play any cards for this, so now it's time for battle preparations. Now we can see they are unfortunately two range away from their development. That means it's not going to offer them one battle die, but they do have their Terminator and one transport. So this means they have a targeting value of two, so the minimum value on their dice is going to be two. As you can see, a transporter and a Terminator means they're rolling three dice, but that Saucerian abductor is rolling four dice. Because of that, they've decided to spend an energy that'll charge up weapons, allowing them to roll that die. Remember, you can roll up to six dice. They do have a titanium here, which they could exchange into energy using their synthesize effect. But it looks like they've decided to just hold here. If they lose this battle, it's not that big of a deal. Remember, they have a tactical operations, which will get them a couple of titanium back, which is certainly a good thing to have. Yeah, they're going to go with this. As I said before, the Saucerian Abductor rolls four dice, so it looks like it's an even match, although of course the Raiders don't have any tactics dice they can play afterwards. Now that was a bad roll for the Raiders. It looks like they got a four, a three, a two, and a one. And not an amazing roll for the blue player. You can see they do have a one, and that is below their targeting level. That means they can re-roll this, although they don't really need to, because it looks like they had already won. Even without re-rolling this, their highest die was higher than the Raider. As you can see, it's 5 to 4, and they don't even need to look at the other dice. So that is a quick resolution, and Blue doesn't have to spend any extra cards to try and make this a win. They're simply going to be victorious. So they'll increase once on the Supremacy track, and then they'll deal 1 damage, which is going to destroy this Saucerian Abductor. In addition to that, they'll gain the reward for defeating that raider. Once again, that is rescue, and that means the blue player will get all of their leaders back from this card, and then every opponent will gain one leader back from this card. So everybody gets something from this, although of course the blue player did better than the rest of us. All right, blue is done with their turn, and that means green can go. Overall, they're pretty happy the blue player got rid of that raider. Uh, it was going to go to most places out here, but now there's quite a few areas where they don't have to fight. Green has decided they're going to launch with their turn, and they're going to send this transport over here. The action there is simple. They can take this moon, and then there is no strike happening from raiders, and obviously no battle, so that was a very quick turn for them. Well, that means we now get to go, and we have to launch, because we currently don't have any ships to return. Now we could choose any of these ships to launch with, and I think we'll go with our science vessel. Remember, it has voyage, so that means it can travel into those nebulas. Now this is a first launch for us because as you can see there are no ships out here so that means we can go onto literally any spot as long as it doesn't have ships already. Remember that attack effect that's associated with the fighters means with a first launch you can land onto a spot that's already occupied and then proceed into a battle after. For us though I think we want to use the voyage effect for this and let's go over here. That lets us take this Nebula Moon. Now, if this is discarded, we could get a credit and a victory point. Or if we slot this into something, then we could get a credit and a victory point ongoing, depending on that situation. So this is just a really good one to have around. After that, we can do the Prescience Effect. Just like before, that means we get to draw the top two cards from the event deck, and then choose which one will go on top, and which one will go down below. This is Energy Surge and Comet Storm. As you can see, the Energy Surge is going to cause a Science Progress Track Scoring, and Comet Storm will cause a Civilization Progress Track Scoring. Now technically we get the same amount of points for both of these right now, but our opponents would get more points from the Energy Surge, so I'm leaning towards the Comet Storm, but there's other things for us to consider. One of those is the special effect. The Energy Surge says each player may activate their primary reactor. And remember that activates all of our green modules. Currently we haven't added any new green modules, so that's not particularly alluring, but it's something to keep in mind. Now the special effect from the Comet Storm says each player gains one ice, then you put one bonus ice onto the newly placed planet, and one on each adjacent region. So that puts a bunch of ice out there that people can pick up, and of course it is important for me to remember that these special effects happen when the event happens, and that's going to be in a while, so we could play towards the specific scoring event that we know is going to be happening. We also could try to get our primary reactor built out if we put this as the event so that we could get that extra activation. Now the other consideration is the Raider that's going to enter play. Comet Storm has Raider C and Energy Surge has Raider D. Those are right up here and let's take a look at the details of these Raiders to help us make this prescience decision. 
see is ice pirates. They roll four dice, but they only have a range of one, but they do have a shield, which means the first time they lose a battle, they will not be destroyed. We can see that they appear on the newly revealed planet, and they have the freeze effect. That says during the escalation phase of battle, if the ice pirates are in the active region, ships may not move into the active region. The reward for defeating the ice pirates is a couple of ice, which makes sense. The other option is the gigantic ion storm. Just like the Ice Pirates, it has a range of 1 and it rolls 4 attack dice, and it also begins on the newly placed planet. Now it has the Ionic Disruption effect, and that says when this strikes, it immediately damages all ships in the active region. Remember, striking is when the raider moves into the active region, so just by moving in, it's going to damage everything, which will destroy ships. So you really need shields in order to take on this ion storm, and that makes it pretty scary. The reward for defeating it is pretty great, though. It advances you once on the science track. I suppose while we're talking about these raiders, we may as well show the last one, even though it's not an option on one of these events. And these are the Corrigan Smugglers. They have a range of one, and they roll three attack dice, and they do have a shield, so they'll need to lose two battles before they're removed. Now, they begin on the Trade Hub Alliance spot, and they have the Smuggled Components effect that says as long as this raider is in Andromeda, the cost to develop a planet is reduced by one resource. So that's interesting. When they are out here, it's actually easier to do those developments. The reward for defeating them lets you advance once on the Commerce track. Of course, there's no way they're going to be showing up soon because they don't appear on either of the cards that we're selecting from. And when we consider the fact that currently we don't have plans to make ships that have shields, I think we should not seed an event that's going to bring out that Ion Storm. That is D, so that means we should not go for the Energy Surge. Instead, we'll put the Comet Storm on top of the deck. The Energy Surge will go to the bottom, and we'll want to keep in mind that when this event happens, we're going to get points based off of our Civilization Progress Track, so we want to go up that as quickly as we can before that event happens. All right, let's put the Comet Storm on top and the Energy Surge to the bottom of that deck. Well, our action is done, and it looks like these raiders can't strike over to us, so that means our turn is over. That means the blue player can go, and they're going to do a quick turn. They're going to launch with this transport. It's going to go here, which is within range one of another one of their ships. Once they arrive here, they are going to take this moon, which simply gives one nanocarbon when discarded or activated. And then we can see the raiders aren't within striking distance, and there is no battle, so that's finished a quick turn for them. After that, green can go, and they don't have any ships left in their launching bay, so they're forced to do a return to station action. As you can see, they don't have any ships over here in the scrapyard. They do have four ships out here on the board, so that means all four of these ships can be used to activate their modules. Now they're going to start by bringing in their heavy cruiser, and they're going to place it here. That cyborg assembly is going to gain them one nanocarbon and one titanium. Next up, they'll return with this transport, and they are going to activate the Intelligence Market. That says they can spend one Titanium to get two credits. After this, they will return with yet another transport, and they're going to go to their Architect. That lets them draw a new Tactic card, or they could do a Development action, and the Development is what they want to do. Now, in order to do that, they do have to have a transport out there on a planet, and they have to have the associated resources for that development, and they have to have enough leaders for that development. As you can see, they have four leaders currently, and a nanocarbon, as well as a couple of credits, although they can, of course, discard these moons to gain those specific resources as well. Now, when it comes to developing, it looks like this is their only option. That is a transport on a planet, and they do have the two credits that are required in order to construct that spaceport. So, they can spend the two credits and then take the spaceport from the supply, as well as the spaceport card. As printed on the board, this spaceport needs two leaders, so they can take those leaders, and those slot in the sides of the spaceport, as you can see, and then they can slot the entire spaceport on top of their transport. After this, they advance once on the Commerce Progress track, which gets them here, and that means they are now at level 2 for the spaceport scoring at the end of the game. Remember, level 2 is worth 7 points, so they are guaranteed 7 points for that spaceport, and if they get this to the top, which seems likely, then the spaceport will be worth 10 points to them at the end of the game. Next up, they'll gain 1 point for every leader on that space and adjacent spots. It looks like that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Remember, this caps out at 10, but it looks like they're going to get 9 points immediately. That will bring them from 11 up to 20. Finally, the yellow player can put this card in front of them, and as a free action, they could use this in order to turn two of any resources into three of any resources. 
Now, before we move on, I think let's talk about the other special effects that show up on these other developments. We can see for the observatory, that lets you gain one discovery token. There's a separate stack of discovery tokens that are placed at the beginning of the game, and just like the ones on the science progress track, you can look through all of these tokens and pick. We haven't seen them yet, and let's just do a sneaky cheating peek right now. As you can see, that one gets you a couple of credits. This one gets you four points immediately. That one lets you advance on the science track and that lets you advance on the industry track, whereas that one lets you get a civilization module. Once again, that effect lets you pick one of these, and then you put the stack face down next to the board. Technically, we weren't supposed to look at those, but I won't tell anyone. After that, we've already talked about the factory, but we haven't talked about the obelisk. That is a simple ability. You just get four energy immediately. The final one is the city, and that ability lets you take one module of your choice. Once again, all of these are one-time use free actions that you can do on your turn. Well, speaking of a turn, it is currently the green player's turn, and they've decided as a free action to immediately use this spaceport. That lets them get rid of two resources to get three other resources, and then they can keep this nearby to help them with endgame scoring. In order to pay for this, they've decided to get rid of two tactics cards. Remember, these count as a resource. Then they get three of any resource of their choice, and they've decided to go with three energy. The reason for that is because they want to use this energy as they continue to activate their modules. Now, speaking of that, they can use this energy to activate that treasury, getting them one credit. Then they can spend this energy to activate compost vats. Remember, you can only spend energy on a row once you've already put a ship there. Now, before they even do that, as a free action, they're going to slot a moon token over here. And they've decided to go for this one. So that is going to give a credit when activated, and of course it's activated as soon as both of the adjacent modules are activated. So by going to the compost vats, they'll gain one nanocarbon, and they'll gain one credit. They can add those into their reserves, and then they will spend their final energy. Although once again, before they do that, they're going to slot this moon token there. Now, by going onto this spot, they can either build a new ship or do a repair action. And remember, you could always pick a repair action, even if there's nothing to repair, you simply gain one victory point. After considering their options, they are going to discard their final tactics card as a resource and a nanocarbon, and they are going to build a new transport. As you can see, it just costs two of any resources, and those are the resources they've decided to go with. So they gain a new transport, which they can add immediately into their launching bay. And then because they activated both of these, that moon will activate, getting them an ice and a titanium. They can add those onto their board. And they are now finally done with their activations. It looks like they got almost all of them activated, just not their primary reactor up there. Overall, that was a really good turn for them. Of course, now they have to return all of their ships back to the launching bay. And of course, they still only have three transports, because one of them was used as the foundation for the spaceport they just built. These can be cleared off, and that's finished a really good turn for the green player. Well, it would now be time for our turn, but I think at this point I'm actually going to stop playing through the game and now talk about how the game ends and how we do final scoring. Now we're going to keep playing the game until any one player has reached a victory point threshold that depends on the length of the game the players want. During the game's setup, everyone has to collectively agree if they want to play a short, medium, or long game, and then you keep playing until anyone has reached 50, 60, or 70 victory points, respectively. Once that happens, that player will finish their turn, then everyone will take one more turn, including the player that jumped over that threshold, and then the game will be over. After that, we can move on to final scoring. Now we're going to gain extra points once the game is over from a variety of different locations, and the first are these five different progress tracks. Every player is going to gain victory points based off of the position of their token. For example, if the game ended right now, we'd get 6 plus 6 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 points. Obviously, you can get a bunch of points by getting these tokens up here before the game ends, and there's a bunch of lucrative other perks along the way. After that, each player can score for the developments that they constructed. Remember, these development cards have a cheat sheet that explain the points you get. It's always going to be 5, 7, or 10 points for the developments, depending on if you've reached level 1, 2, or 3 in the respective progress track up here. Once again, if the game ended right now, the green player would get 7 points for this level 2 spaceport, whereas the blue player is currently getting 5 points for their level 1 factory. After this, every player is going to lose two points for every one of their modules that is currently damaged. As you can see in this example, right now blue has one damaged module, so they would lose two points, but the rest of us wouldn't because we've repaired all of our modules. After this, players can potentially gain vault bonus victory points, which depends on if they've reached the vault spots over here on the commerce track. 
As I explained before, if your token is down here, you get nothing for the vault scoring. If your token is on these three spots, you get one point for every resource you have at the end of the game. And again, that does include those tactics cards. And if you're at here or above, you get two points for each one of those resources. Next up, players might get points from Civilization Modules. We didn't actually pick any of these up throughout the tutorial, but some of these blue Civilization Modules have endgame scoring conditions on them. For example, this Office of Lunar Property says at the end of the game, that player will gain two points for each moon token that they have to a maximum of 10 points. Of course, that will only activate if it's not damaged. Within this deck, there are other end game conditions. We can see this one right here is the patent office. That says that that player gains four points plus two more victory points for each ship upgrade that they have. Now, the final thing we get end game points for are our leaders at our station. We get one point for every leader. So this is another reason we definitely want to bring our leaders back. We, of course, need them to make these developments, but they're worth one point each, which is not too bad. After adding up all of these points, the player with the most victory points will be the winner. If there is a tie, then the tied player with the most modules will be the winner. And if there's still a tie, then the tied player with the most resources at the end of the game will be the winner. Well, at this point, I do believe I've taught just about all of the rules to the game, so that's going to bring this tutorial to a close. I hope you enjoyed learning how to play Andromeda's Edge. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.